At the time of our earliest ancestors, this place was lush and green. Back then, there were rivers and lakes with communities of animals living in and beside the water. Here were the pigs and the elephants whose fossils we found. Deep in the forest live the apes from which we and chimpanzees are descended. The lives of today's chimpanzees hinted our close kinship with the apes. Even though they have smaller brains than we do, chimpanzees have many human characteristics. They're highly social. They have a sort of language, and they use tools. In the distant past, we shared a common ancestor with these chimps. So our earliest ancestor must have been part ape, part human. For well over a century, people have been fascinated by the search to find the missing link a creature that would bridge the gap between ourselves and the primitive apes. It was always thought that the key feature that separates us from the apes is intelligence. It was logical to think then that the earliest ancestors would have large brains. The argument goes like this. The chimpanzee skull holds a brain three times smaller than modern man. If increase in brain size set us on the path from ape to human, it was thought that the missing link should have first developed a big, human-like brain. Back in the heat of Hadar, following the trail of the missing link is grueling work. The sun pushes the temperature to over a hundred degrees. But there's always an air of anticipation, because you never know what might be in the next ravine. No, no. This is a fossil finder's dream, a perfectly complete skull, partly concealed beneath a covering of sandstone. But it's not one of our ancestors. It's a baboon, a kind of monkey. In a century of fossil hunting, skulls have always been the prize. No, 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 no. After all, if our earliest ancestor were a large-brained ape, a skull would be the perfect proof. But the story is like a detective story, full of false trails, never straightforward, and it can all change unexpectedly. Because from time to time, a fossil is found that is so different that it entirely turns the story of our origins upside down. The trail began not with a skull, but with something totally unexpected. I was surveying late one afternoon when we were out collecting some elephant, elephant teeth, and I looked down on the ground and found in a couple of pieces this knee joint. At first, I thought it was just from a monkey, maybe a baboon, but it went together in a way that uh, didn't look like any monkey. If it wasn't a monkey's knee, what was it? It looked vaguely human, but how could that be? I needed an expert opinion. Also be advised, unit 716 is on the scene at this time. Owen Lovejoy is an anatomist, part-time forensic scientist, and an expert on animal locomotion. If anyone could tell me what sort of creature that knee belonged to, he could. When Don brought the head our knee back from Ethiopia, he brought it over to my house and laid it out on the living room carpet. And I knew instantly that was a human knee. 
my suspicions were confirmed. As Lovejoy pointed out, the joint had all the hallmarks of a creature that moved around on two legs, not on all fours. Walking upright is something that only humans can do, and it needs a special kind of knee joint. One that can be locked straight. A chimp gets around on all fours. If it tries to walk upright, its knee joint doesn't lock. It's forced to walk with a bent leg, and that's tiring. This mysterious fossil really perplexed us. What was a modern-looking human knee doing among fossils that were millions of years old? We had to find out how old that knee really was. The hills at Hadar contain distinct layers of light-colored volcanic ash. And once we know how old the ash is, we know that any fossil found beneath it is at least that old. Uh, label this H92. With the eye of a connoisseur, the geologists select the best ash samples for analysis back in the lab. Dating techniques are so precise that we only need small samples, as little as one single crystal or grain. The purest crystals are blasted by an argon laser we've nicknamed Flash Gordon. As it melts, the crystal releases argon gas. The amount of gas given off gives us a direct estimate of the age of the volcanic ash. And once we know that, we can work out the age of any fossil we've found nearby. The results were exactly what we had hoped for. The knee was over three million years old, one of the oldest human fossils ever found. I felt sure we were onto something completely new. Yet the knee posed troubling questions. What sort of ancient creature would have a modern knee? I kept turning it over and over in my mind. What did it mean? We needed more fossils, and luckily the knee generated such scientific interest that we had no trouble mounting another expedition. And the next year, we were back once more at Hadar. Good. Very good. <laughs> On every expedition, breakfast is the time we spend planning the day's work. The impression, uh, you know, right in the, in the sandstone. And it would be nice if we could uh, make a, at least a, a mold of it and then back it out and make a cast because it, it would preserve... The One morning, two of us decided to go back to a gully that we hadn't finished working on the day before. Fossil hunters sometimes rely on hunches. And that morning, I had a hunch that this would be my lucky day. I was headed back to my Land Rover. It was about noontime, and I was going to uh, drive back to camp. And uh, I just happened to look over my right shoulder, and I noticed a, a small piece of bone resting on the surface of the ground. And as I began to look around and scan the slope, I could see not only bits of a leg, but bits of a skull, a little piece of a jaw. And I realized right there in that noonday sun that what I had literally stumbled across was most of an entire skeleton. As more and more of these precious fragments came back from the field, a buzz of excitement ran through the camp. Everyone knew instinctively this was something big. To find such a fossil was uh, wonderful for me, you know. It was a night I'll never forget. It's an area about that big. It's not, it's not here. And it was wonderful for Ethiopia, too. After this, everybody wanted to come here to look at our Gucci. The shape of the lower jaw and tiny details of the teeth 
alerted us to an intriguing mixture of ape and human-like features, something we'd never seen before. Some of the fragments were tiny. Hundreds of them were collected, carefully cleaned and laid out on the table. The whole camp was absorbed with the mystery of what this creature looked like. The pelvis was in fragments. It took hours to piece it together. In Ethiopia, you know, we called her Dinkanesh. It means thing of wonder. The hours passed. No one thought of sleep. We had so much to do. Then we looked at the knee. It was modern, human-like, just like the one I'd found the previous year. As we put the bones together, we saw they came from one tiny adult female, standing only three and a half feet tall. This was the creature we'd been looking for. The celebration began. One song was played over and over. And we named our new find Lucy. Lucy became an almost instant celebrity in anthropological circles. She didn't look like anything we had ever found before. She was something very different. And because of that, she opened up for us an entire new chapter on human origins. 